Okay, so how, hi everyone. As David was saying, I'm very pleased to be here precisely because I strongly support the EPOC Master Program. I think it's a great opportunity. Uh, the first time I heard about EPOC was in 2014. And since then, I've met many of the cohorts and I'm not exaggerating if I say that I find this type of master one of the most exciting, stimulating academic experiences that you can have and in many respects and that it will open you a lot of doors, not only in terms of professional life or, or PhDs or whatever you want to do afterwards, but mostly doors in your head to open and further develop questions which, although I know we still need to find a job and have a living, I also think that we uh, should uh, embrace the programs and the time we have to develop our mental capacities to try to build a better world. And basically, that's what my research is about. I've been always concerned about the state of capitalism in general, the contemporary forms of capital accumulation. And uh, throughout time, I've realized that there were some specific transformations that were at the heart of uh, capital accumulation in contemporary capitalism that were not being addressed, uh, at, or at least not being addressed in the sufficient depthness and complexity that I thought was necessary. And therefore, uh, for some time, I've been working on this framework that uh, can be called intellectual monopoly capitalism. And for today, what I wanted to do with you was first to try to guide you through my theoretical framework, but afterwards focus, as David was saying, uh, among the different industries, the different sectors that I've been studying within this framework, uh, very paradigmatic one and also very topical and popular one is the digital transition, digital capitalism or the digital economy and in particular big tech companies from the US and from China. Therefore, most of what we are going to discuss today concerns these companies, but let me insist that the framework is not a framework that is attempt to analyze specifically these companies, or only these companies, although, as I said, they are a paradigmatic example, but it's ultimately aimed at explaining general capitalism dynamics, of which tech giants are perhaps its most developed form. So to start, I would like to directly guide you through a, a starting question that has been in my head for some time now which refers to what do contemporary leading corporations have in common. Here in this slide, you have the largest companies in market capitalization. And of course, tech giants are very easy to find because they are quite gigantic. But it's not only, as I said, uh, a question about tech giants. It's, is there anything that these companies have in common that makes them big in terms of market capitalization that explains the industrial differentiation between different types of firms, the fact that the baker where you probably buy your baguette every day, although it's a still a firm, it's a still part of an industry, doesn't seem to be so much alike Apple or Amazon. So what, is there anything that all these companies have in common? Can we still claim some theoretical analysis that go beyond analyzing a specific case studies to try to make sense of this technological, what I will call as a technological differentiation between firms. So with this question in mind, let's uh, start discussing some stylized facts that of course will not replace uh, theoretical analysis, which is why I'm, I'm presenting you after this. But in any case, I think it's interesting to begin discussing about some key uh, stylized facts of contemporary capitalism. The first one is that profits are getting more and, and a greater part of the cake, a greater piece of the cake in terms of GDP. We may afterwards discuss about the validity of GDP as a measure of value, but leaving this discussion aside, in any case, profits are concentrating a greater part of the world GDP. But within profits, when we start digging into What's inside these profits, what we see is a highly unequal distribution of profits between firms. And here you have some data on this, how 0.001% of the global largest corporations earn around one third of all the corporate profits. And also, there is a rise in markups that has been concentrated in the top of the markup distribution. So those that already have higher markups are increasing their markups even more. So they are earning even more. And when we look at the sectors where this process is taking place, and here we start having some insights on digital economy, 
markups are higher in digital intensive sectors. But more broadly, since I mentioned that I'm not only looking at digital, but more in general at what do contemporary leading corporations have in common, other two quite striking stylized facts are one, if we think of the Standard & Poor's 500 firms, therefore the 500 largest corporations listed in the US, in, the 19, in 1975, only 17% of their assets were intangible assets, whereas that figure nowadays is 90%. So these companies are intensive in intangible assets. Not only that, if we want to have a look at another stylized fact, they are also concentrating, in particular within intangible assets, intellectual property rights. The IP5 patents, for those of you that are not from the innovation uh, option in this master's, are uh, patents that are inventions that were patented in the five largest patent offices. And it's a typical indicator to measure the quality of a patent. To say, okay, this is not just uh, privatization of any kind of knowledge, but of something that it seems to be quite valuable in economic terms. So with these stylized facts in mind, what I started developing was a framework or a theory that states that contemporary leading corporations, what they have in common is that they are concentrating systematically and in, a, in an expanding way portions of society's knowledge and that they use this knowledge but in an exclusive way, not as a knowledge commons, not as just as public knowledge that has always contributed to capital accumulation, but, an but as an exclusive way which means that they are transforming that knowledge into intangible assets. So the basis of their power is that they're systematically transforming knowledge into intangible assets and using those intangible assets to appropriate, to capture value from society. And I will come back to this in a second, but before, and again, for those of you who are not that familiarized with this jargon, the discussion of what's an intangible asset is still an ongoing discussion, but let me just say, uh, regardless of the definition of the OECD, which is what you have on the slide, that intangible assets, as I've been saying just a second ago, are knowledge. It's knowledge that is accessed in an exclusive way. So its access is being curtailed. It's not that knowledge before, I insist, was not contributing to capital accumulation. The difference is that greater portions of knowledge are now being accessed in an exclusive way by certain corporations. And when we think of knowledge, it's not only knowledge that is made explicit and that is subjected, for instance, to intellectual property rights, but a whole deal, and this is particularly important for the case of the digital economy, a whole deal of this knowledge is kept secret or in tacit forms. When we think of tacit knowledge, it's not only relevant for the digital economy. Tacit knowledge is at the basis of global value chain leaders' power. Global value chain leaders' capacity to become intellectual monopolies relies on the fact that they are the, the only, the single company inside the global value chain that has the know-how and the know-who for the whole production process. They know who can do what and how each step of the production process is taking place. So that exclusive knowledge to plan, organize, and ultimately to reintegrate the chain remains either tacit or secret and in the hands of the global value chain leader. So that's also another type of intangible asset that uh, contributes to explaining this emergence of intellectual monopolies. And of course, in the digital economy, there are several examples of why secrecy is so important. Let me just briefly mention uh, what uh, it says on the top of the slide, which is that only 15% of the artificial intelligence papers, so papers dealing with artificial intelligence topics, disclose the code. Typically, we think of scientific publications as a way to uh, expand access to knowledge. But if the paper, the only thing that says is, we develop an algorithm that does this, this, and that, and the outputs are this, this, and that, you're not really saying how you did it, what's inside the algorithm. So that paper is not really disclosing knowledge. Knowledge is a still kept secret. So this is why that figure is relevant. So going back to the discussion about intellectual monopolies, if we need to think of why now, why are we witnessing the emergence of these companies in this particular time of history? What I've been arguing is that it is the result of four things that come together. I will not have the time to go in deep into any of them because as I said, I want just to briefly present you the framework and focus on tech giants. But let me just say, I will say a brief word on the 
both the two on the top and the institutional and political transformations. And since I will say a bit of them in one second in other slides, let me just say one word about how technological changes themselves contributed to the emergence of intellectual monopoly capitalism. First, with the first ICT revolution, every outcome, every output of a knowledge production process can be accessed from any part of the world kind of in a second. Somebody publishes something like tweets, I have a new paper on this, and anybody can access that. So corporations have a direct access to all the knowledge that is being produced constantly by many different types of organizations. And not only that, but also they can, uh, the first ICT revolution was essential for starting a process of modularization of knowledge. This idea of global value chains, of the production process being sliced and diced in different steps and parts distributed around the world, the same thing has happened with the production of knowledge, with the production of science and technology. So let's move on and discuss a bit about the institutional and political transformations. And I will just click on everything so that I don't need to be in front of the screen all the time. There are many, many things to discuss in terms of changes at the level of institutional and political transformations. I will just mention them kind of in bullet points and we can come back if you want during the discussion. The first thing to say is that this is a global transformation. But as much as it is a global transformation, in terms of political transformations, in many respects, it started in the US. It also has some background in China, but I will not cover that today. And in the case of the US, it's not just the transformation of the intellectual property rights regime. You may have heard that since the 1980s, there were many acts put in place in the US that basically created a more stringent, a harder uh, intellectual property rights regime. They expanded the lens of the patents. What can be patented was also expanded. Now molecules, code can be patented. And of course, think molecules, pharma industry, code, tech industry, ICT in general. So kind of the most powerful uh, industries in terms of intangibles are directly connected to these transformations. And also there is an inflection point at the world level when all this that was happening in the US moves to the world level and that was TRIPS agreement at what happened after that. It was the first moment when the US way of thinking about intellectual property rights was imposed on the rest of the world with the help of Europe. And it was done so through, uh, in a way, in a very, uh, in, in, in a very hierarchical way, imposing developing countries, peripheral countries, to accept trips. Otherwise, core countries would reduce or limit the, ex the exports of developing countries to core countries. And as you may know, developing countries or peripheral countries rely on exporting primary, in, in particular primary goods to get the dollars to buy the other things that are needed, to pay debt. Therefore, it was kind of an extortion, and most of the world accepted the TRIPS agreement. And since that, other uh, commercial agreements started including intellectual property rights conditions. But as I said, it was not only, this is not only about intellectual property rights becoming more uh, stringent and more uh, overarching in the sense that they are covering or you can patent almost everything. There were other political transformations in the US. Among others, the, the antitrust policy was completely reduced to focus only on a very narrow Chicago Boys way of thinking of uh, antitrust. Basically, the only thing that matters is the consumer. As much as the prices are, bad, are, are low, there is nothing to be worried about. It became almost impossible to prove that a merger or acquisition was contributing to a more uh, anti-competitive market. On top of that, when companies started working at a global level, it became clear that states operate under jurisdictions that are national, whereas companies are global. And those jurisdictions were not aligned. Therefore, many tax loopholes emerge that contribute to explaining why multinational corporations, in particular the top 10% of the companies that are listed in the US, pay an effective tax rate that is below the effective tax rate of all the rest of the listed companies in the world. So this favored, in particular, companies that are intensive in intangible assets. Why? Because if you have a factory, it's quite complicated to say, no, my factory is not in the US, it's in Ireland. And then you go to Ireland and there is nothing there. But if you say, no, my intellectual property right is in Ireland, who can tell you that you are not right? 
So basically, the companies that are intensive in intangible assets, for them, it's way easier to uh, use these loopholes to diminish the tax rates that they need to pay and therefore to avoid taxes on a global scale. And the major tax avoiding companies are tech giants and also pharma companies. And on top of that, the other thing was that in the US, although you may think of, hey, but why are you speaking about industrial policy? This Danny Roderick guy has been saying that industrial policy is coming back and you're saying that since the 70s the US had an industrial policy? Well, yes. We mostly read just economists, but if we read also political scientists, we will find out that the US, since the 70s onwards, had a hidden industrial policy, quite focused on science, technology, and innovation, and quite focused on, uh, in a way, fostering some particular companies. And it is not surprising that in the TRIPS agreement, the companies drafting the agreement were Pfizer, IBM, Microsoft. So companies drafting the agreement that was afterwards signed by the world concerning intellectual property rights. So all this since the 80s more or less until uh, the early 2000s of course explains part of the why now. But it's not, as I said, just a matter of looking at intellectual property rights and political transformations. Because when I speak of an intellectual monopoly, I'm speaking of a company that is monopolizing access to knowledge beyond intellectual property rights. And actually, on that basis, the company can appropriate value in the form of an intellectual rent. And I insist on this, and we can come back. Rents are not new value. Rents are a redistribution of value. Therefore, someone is losing that value when these companies concentrate more and more rents. But as I mentioned, also, there are some specific characteristics of knowledge. And let me, before digging into that, say one word about capitalist competition. Since Marx, because typically innovation is attributed to Schumpeter with, honestly, most of the things he said, almost everything he said about innovation was already in Marx. And uh, the basis of the idea, both in Marx and Schumpeter, was that firms had, in the, the first Schumpeter at least, was that firms had an equal chance to innovate. They were not using the word innovation, they were using the development of productive forces, they were using the creating new products, new processes, etc., etc. But in any case, they were speaking about what today we call an innovation, and they were saying every company, every individual capital has equal chances to succeed in this constant race for innovation. Why a constant race? Because once you innovate, you get an extraordinary profit, the rent. But for them, the rent was always a temporary thing. There was nothing saying that once a company innovated, it could perp that rent could perpetuate over time. Actually, eventually, other companies would copy the innovation, other ones would die trying to do it, so this idea of creative destruction. And what eventually happened, if you think of this cyclical process, was that everything was going back and back, like a cyclical process. But actually, knowledge, it's not just producing knowledge is different from producing other things. We produce knowledge on the basis of other people's knowledge, on society's knowledge. I've just mentioned Marx and Schumpeter. It's not that I came up with these ideas by myself. I work with a lot of colleagues, and I've also read a lot of people that wrote before me. And the same thing happens with any form of knowledge. Knowledge is a process that leads to cumulative causation. And associated with this is the idea of absorptive capacity, which means that both individuals and organizations that are at the level of the most advanced technique or technology, what we, in terms of neoclassical economics, may say at the production frontier, or the frontier of possibilities of production, therefore we know everything that's out there, we will be more prepared to absorb new knowledge. Think of a kid that is in kindergarten versus you. If the kid is sitting here, he may listen to me for hours, but of course he will not get a thing. Whereas you, because you've absorbed a lot of knowledge throughout school and university, can get what I'm saying. So that's the basic idea of absorptive capacity. And putting these two things, things together, and considering at the same time that firms are constantly trying to innovate, to win competition, to have extra profits at some point, or at least to avoid being left behind, these two things together contribute to thinking that if a firm innovates and uses part of that rent to further innovate, of course this is not for granted and it may fail, but it will be better prepared than the rest. Its absorptive capacity will be better than those of the rest, 
And if, in particular, the firm is curtailing others from accessing that knowledge, the others will not be able to accumulate that knowledge and keep innovating as much as the firm that innovated once did. So that firm can perpetuate that process. Put that together with a whole in the institutional and political set of transformations that further contribute to this, and we get a situation where intellectual rents perpetuate over time because the same firms are winning the innovation race. And therefore, we arrive at a moment when there is a, from just a temporary advantage, a permanent advantage of certain firms over others, and therefore a technological in differentiation of firms. And what is interesting is that those that are left behind, it's not that there are companies that go bankrupt, that die. They remain, but as subordinate firms. So what we find is a whole set of ways of organizing production that are between the two extremes of Adam Smith analysis of the division of labor. On the one hand, we have the pin factory, a production process that is organized according to a plan and where everyone is collaborating because that is a vertical way of organizing production according to a plan defined by the manager, let's say. And on the other hand, the other opposite, the picture is awful, I don't know why, but it's not that awful in my computer at least, I'm sorry. But on the other hand, we have a market. And it's another form of division of labor, it's a social division of labor, which in capitalism, the market as a social division of labor is supposed to be an anarchic way of, of dividing and organizing labor. Nobody is telling anyone what to do or how to do it. Again, the two extreme versions and a fiction that we inherited from Adam Smith onwards. But what we see nowadays in capitalism is that planning is now beyond the frontiers of the factory. That planning actually is conquering spaces of what before was the social division of labor. And it's doing so on the basis of this appropriation of knowledge, of this constant appropriation of knowledge. And here the picture is Tim Cook, which is Apple CEO inside at uh, Foxconn, which is a Taiwanese company factory in China, and it's where the iPhones are really manufactured. <coughs> so moving on, because I'm, we're already super late, uh, moving a bit uh, faster, what we see is that these companies, these intellectual monopolies, have the capacity to organize production processes beyond their legally owned capital. And they can do so, they plan, they organize production systems that take different forms. And you've probably heard of global value chains, global production networks, the franchising model, the platforms, even local networks of subcontractors. They all have in common that there is a leading corporation that bases its power on the accumu systematic accumulation of knowledge and uses that knowledge to further perpetuate its power through planning and organizing the production that is taking place in all these other organizations. What will be kept in-house and what will be outsourced depends on each specific case. In the typical analysis of global value chain, it was assumed that the tangible capital was going to be outsourced and that everything that was related to more intangible investments was going to be kept in-house. I will show you that tech giants both Although they are intellectual monopolies systematically monopolizing knowledge, they organize innovation in networks, therefore they outsource innovation steps, and they also keep in-house part of the tangible investment. And I will come back to this later on, but let me just briefly describe this idea of a corporate production system that will include all these different ways of organizing production, the platforms, the global value chain, and so on and so forth. But what, if we need to give a definition, we may say that it is a capitalist plan system of reproduction and exchange. Markets are also, the platforms are also markets. Uh, exchange of commodities that is led by an intellectual monopoly. And when I, it doesn't matter the type of firms, that's something I will skip because there are different types of subordinate firms. Not every firm is equal. It's not the same thing to think of a laggard company that still participates, super exploiting the workers at a level that we probably only see in slavery, versus Foxconn that also super exploits its workers, but at the same time has the most updated techniques that are capable of producing with what is required by Apple, for instance, and other companies. But we can come back to that later. The core of what I want to share with you in relation to this is the idea of planning. Planning is not only something that is done by states. Planning is not only something that takes place inside the firm, but it's actually a capacity 
that some individual capitals are developing to organize, to control portions of capitalism, I insist, beyond their legally owned capital. And this is a win-win situation because they harvest the profits, diminishing the risks. And they decide, again, what, how the process will take place through what can be called as sign-up contracts. These are contracts where the subordinate company has only one decision to make, whether the company wants to accept or deny the, the agreement. The company cannot set the terms of the agreement. In some cases, the agreement will be more explicit and include a lot of things, including standards. In other cases, there will be a lot of things that, are remain, remain, that remain tacit. And therefore, the leading corporation, the intellectual monopoly, will visit the plants, like Tim Cook in the case of Foxconn, will visit the other plants and say, this should be changed, this needs to be like that and like that. So there are many specific ways of doing it. But again, it's planning, it's at the core of the transformation, and planning relies on data. Think of the people that say that uh, planning was impossible in the USSR because we would all end up dressing with the same clothes and the same size. If you have the data, I assure you, if you have the data Amazon has of all of us, we will definitely not end up like that if we go and live in a planned society. But as I said, also it's not only about planning production, but also planning innovation. And here in my work with a colleague uh, who, uh, who's called Ventake Lundbal, we've been working on this idea of a corporate innovation system, where again, this is also a global system, and it's also integrated by several other organizations, universities, public research organizations, startup companies. They all, all these organizations have in common that they produce part of the innovation profit, but they are not those profiting from the process. The resulting knowledge is mostly appropriating and that appropriated, and that's why I speak of knowledge predation. <laughs> it's appropriated by the intellectual monopoly and contributes to further reinforcing this company's intellectual monopoly. When we speak of planning, a creative process is not that the intellectual monopoly will plan every step of the way, but it will define, it will focus on defining very clearly the big lines of research. The research agenda will be defined by the intellectual monopoly not only for those organizations directly linked to it, but also to the whole discipline. There is a paper on, on how big pharma companies actually influence the research agenda of the whole uh, field of health and biomedical sciences that we have just published with an interdisciplinary team. I can tell you the reference afterwards, but it's just to give you more insights on how these companies have a capacity to influence the research that is being done not only with the companies that are directly working with them, or companies or other organizations. And of course, this further contributes to reinforce the, these companies' intellectual monopolies. Therefore, uh, what we have is a context where we can think of uh, big tech and big uh, pharma companies, big tech and pharma, big tech from the US and China as intellectual monopolies. But as a particular type of intellectual monopolies, because these companies, as I will argue in a bit, are data driven intellectual monopolies. And I don't need to emphasize on the fact that these companies are the largest companies in the world, the big winners of the pandemic, that their market capitalization has skyrocketed in the last years. Here you have uh, the, uh, this is 2010, then here, you see the mouse, yes. Yeah. Here you have uh, 2020, early to first, uh, the 1st of January 2020, and this is the final day of 2020. That's to show you that while the rest of the world was really in probably the worst crisis ever, these companies were doing increasingly and increasingly better. But it's not that these companies are huge and profitable and the most powerful. This is something we all know. The question is where they base their, their power on, their political and their economic power, or their political economy power. And what I will argue is, as I anticipated, that these companies are data-driven intellectual monopolies. What does this mean? I will first explain you something about big data and how it works and machine learning, and I'm sorry if you've already heard about this, but basically, the data that we produce every day the raw data is not what really contributes or, or can be transformed into an intangible asset. It's by putting data together and processing that data and analyzing it and producing what Gunta calls digital intelligence that a company can not only inform its ongoing business, modify and improve its ongoing business, but also 
find new possibilities of innovation. And how does this process work? Well, in particular, within artificial intelligence, there is a technique which is within machine learning that is called deep learning. And together with neural networks, these approaches to machine learning are approaches where the algorithms learn, change by themselves, improve by themselves as they process more data. Think of what happens with machines. We buy a machine with a certain technology. As, we, as the company uses the machine, the machine loses its value. The value is transferred to what is being produced. We are saying that in the case of algorithms, there is a means of production that's the more we, that the more we use it, the better it gets. It's completely at odds with all the other uh, means of production that existed in history. And not only that, we are saying that this is a way, an automatic way of innovating. Just by processing data, the means of production will become better. And there is nothing else to be done. So once it was produced, the algorithm, by processing more data, it will get better and better and better. So as the tech giant's algorithms process more of our data, their algorithms get better, the production of digital intelligence improves, and their capacity to extract, extract more value from society increases. So a data-driven intellectual monopoly is an intellectual monopoly that is not just appropriating knowledge. It's also appropriating a new method of invention, a new way to invent new things. And this is why the power of these companies can be considered way larger than that of other types of intellectual monopolies, let's say big pharma. But again, this could be just me arguing that they are doing that. How can we prove? So, because so far, all the things that I've said may sound, okay, I believe you. But we still need to bring some empirics to all this to, to make sense of what I'm saying. And a way to do so is to start by looking at the content of this company's scientific publications. Why scientific publications? Because they give way more data, but if, uh, way more, more information. In the patents, when, you, when a company writes the patent description, they are quite cryptic. Still, I will show you in a second also a patent analysis that says basically the same. But here, together with Lundvall, we are looking at a text mining analysis that we did on the content of selected tech giants scientific publications between 2014 and 2019. And what I highlighted for you, and I don't know why the colors are not so clear as in my laptop, but in green, this is supposed to be the green, for example. And on top, machine learning is green, for instance. <coughs> in green, you have terms that refer to the technique, to machine learning. Machine learning, deep, ne deep learning, neural networks, and others. In yellow, but it doesn't look like a yellow, the yellow is supposed to be like here, natural language, computer vision. We, you have the uh, applications, the most, uh, the, what is called as functional applications. What, because first we have the development of the, te the technology as a general purpose technology, so machine learning, deep learning, and so on. Then we have the first layer of applications, still quite broad, and these are computer vision, like speech recognition, and so on and so forth. And then the algorithms by themselves will not be able to learn. They need data. So there is also a lot of research on data, how to handle data, how to analyze data, and that's why in blue you have a lot of terms that refer to data. And on top of that, there are some terms referring to cloud computing, and I will come back to that later on. A similar analysis that I don't have the time to show you now is this one. It's about Amazon in particular and its portfolio of patents. And in a nutshell, what you can see here is how Amazon in the beginning was just focusing its research on e-commerce, on its e-commerce business, how to better tackle consumers and so on, and how it, extend, it started expanding its scope and ended up being a company, a high-tech company, that actually is doing research on this general purpose technology, as we were say, seeing here. So machine learning, deep, deep learning, and so on. We can come back to this later on, and I can explain you how I do this. But just to give you a hint of what can be said from this onwards. The first insight is that e-commerce is not the real business for a company like Amazon. At least not the business where it will get the currency money. It will get another form of money, which is data money. And this is why it can afford not being profitable, although it also squeezes profit from uh, the third party uh, producers or sellers. Indeed, it does so as well. But in any case, Amazon can afford being even uh, 
uh, not profitable at all in its e-commerce business in terms of currency money, in terms of the typical way of thinking of profits, because it's earning a lot in terms of data. With all that data, it fits its algorithms and it fits its purposes not only in terms of e-commerce, but in terms of all the businesses that Amazon is developing. And of course, this is a problem for all the other companies that are uh, more or less related to uh, the businesses of Amazon. And another thing that can be said, given the importance of data, is that Amazon can be thought as a company that is the visible hand of the market. Perhaps you heard Chandler's idea of visible hand, and their visible hand there is the management, because the companies that Chandler was analyzing were companies that were becoming larger. He was speaking of the new integrated enterprise, a company that was not outsourcing, but insourcing everything, and therefore, the area of planning, the pin factory, was becoming larger. Therefore, planning, which was restricted to what happened inside the pin factory, was larger. Whereas, what we are seeing now is a process where the pin factory becomes smaller, but still planning capacity expands. So, this is a different type of visible hand of the market. It's a company that knows everything from us, what we did, what we thought about doing, what we scrolled over with our mouse, or whatever we did in the platform, and the same thing for sellers. And it does so, further developing its capacity to, pro to become a data-driven intellectual monopoly, constantly appropriating big data and further developing its AI algorithms. And through this process, it also created a new market that, com that further reinforces intellectual monopoly and that change the nature of the relationship between producers and users of technology. The cloud computing market basically works in a way where the user of the technology receives the technology as a black box. It has no chances to do reverse engineering, not because the technology is patented, it's just because it doesn't know what's inside. There is no way to know what's inside an Amazon Web Services service that you are using. So there is no way in which the user can learn this doing, using, uh, interacting way of learning, the learning by doing and all the other related, related things is seriously curtailed in this context. As companies rely more and more, because it, just, it is cheaper also, on cloud computing services, they start losing a lot of their capacities to learn. Their absorptive capacity diminishes over time. So the subordination of the users of technology expands, and this is one of the most concentrated markets. And something that I didn't say is that indeed being an intellectual monopoly contributes to market concentration. But I'm not speaking here of market monopolies. We need to go beyond your classical economics idea that a monopoly is a market monopoly. First, because the extent of the market is always a matter of discussion, and also because that leaves us always in the realm of the market. And we need to look at capitalism as a whole, and that includes looking at the production processes. And when we look at the production processes, it's not only commodities. We should also be looking at what happens inside houses, in the caring economy, in relation to the environment, and in the process of producing new things, therefore creative goods such as innovation. But again, Indeed, this is a very concentrated market, and this in part explains both things together, cloud computing and the, um, uh, and the fact that these are data-driven intellectual monopolies. It also explains the other thing that I was saying uh, some time ago, when I was saying not only these companies outsource innovation, but also keep in-house part of the tangible investment, what tangible assets I was speaking of, data centers, internet cables, all the digital infrastructure that is required to move data and process data around the world, that is also being concentrated by these companies. If you look at the figures, you will see that although their revenues are going up, the tangible investment of these companies over revenues is going up as well. So they are investing a share of uh, their income, a growing share of the revenues in tangible, so in separate tangible, uh, assets, precisely to store data and so on and so forth. And since we are very ill-equipped as a society to measure intangible assets, a good way to analyze the intangible assets that these companies are harvesting is to look at how their tangible investments grow, because the tangible investments grow at the same rhythm of their intangible assets, because they need to store more data, process more data, and so on and so forth. 
Here you have some data on this, we come back later. This to me is quite impressive, is the is uh, how the different internet cables, the undersea internet cables were uh, created around the world and nowadays 50% of those cables are owned by Amazon, Facebook, Google and Microsoft. Just to give you an idea of tangible assets concentration. But as I was saying, it's not only about the cloud computing, this is part of the outcome of becoming a data-driven intellectual monopoly because you're already doing all that for yourself and therefore you can always offer part of that to others. And that reinforces also this company's intellectual monopoly because when a data set from someone else is processed with one of the algorithms that is in Amazon Web Service, the algorithm will get better. So even if there is no employee of Amazon sneaking into the data, Amazon's algorithm will still get better. And on top of that, this process of constantly producing digital intelligence enables these companies to expand to every possible sector, not just as cloud computing suppliers. These are not, what I'm showing you here is not the cloud computing services that these companies are offering to different sectors. These are all the sectors that are uh, identified as, sector, as uh, application fields of artificial intelligence. So you have healthcare, you have the military, the government, and many others. And these companies are already developing solutions as suppliers. So they are also conquering spaces even of other intellectual monopolies. And it's the case of the automobile industry. It's also the case of healthcare to give you two uh, examples that are quite interesting to analyze. What you have here is a way of mapping a corporate innovation system by looking at the co-authorships of a firm. In this case of Google, between 2018, no, this is 2014 and 2019. And I will come back to another of these uh, maps in a bit. The only thing that I want to show you here is the topics. Each cluster of co-authorships is also analyzed according to its most frequent topics. And if you look at the topics, yes, of course, the main to a cluster refers to things that are at the core of a company like Alphabet or Google, what you would expect. But then you move and see, for instance, this cluster and the topics are respiratory system, critical care medicine, astronomy and astrophysics. And you go up there and you see clinical neurology, neurosciences, engineering. So these companies are developing research, are focusing also their science and technology strategies on other fields, not only conquering the digital economy uh, infrastructure, but also using that to conquer other sectors. And you can see that also when you look at the uh, sectors that correspond to, uh, for instance, Google's acquisitions over time, and how since 2014 onwards, there are sectors like education and healthcare that became particularly important, and also how uh, companies that are, were uh, developing solutions for data and analytics and artificial intelligence became way more important, whereas in the first part of this uh, acquisition history, artificial intelligence was over there. So really not that important. 2012 in particular is a key year to think about this, and we can come back to this later, but uh, to move on very fast, because I think I only have like 10 minutes. Uh, as I said, these companies are also outsourcing innovation. And they do so, and they expand the intellectual monopolies on the basis of organizing what I mentioned were corporate innovation systems. So here, just as what I uh, presented before about Google, what you see is Amazon's most frequent co-authors uh, from 2018-2019. Uh, there is a lot of things to analyze here, even and there are insights on technological cooperation between intellectual monopolies because you will find Facebook, Google, uh, Apple, Microsoft among its most frequent co-authors. So these companies are not only their main rivals, but at the same time, these are companies with whom uh, the tech giants establish quite strong collaborations among them. And the same thing can be uh, observed in the case of Big Pharma. So intellectual monopolies both cooperate and compete for technology, for different moments or steps of the development of new science and technology. And the main takeaway of this type of mapping, where you see who these companies are publishing with, and you can witness that they are publishing on different topics with many, many, many organizations, mostly universities, but also other firms, and so on, is that when you compare this type of analysis with patent co-ownership, 
we have a, an striking different result. All these hundreds of organizations that were indeed doing research with Amazon because they publish a paper. Nobody publishes a paper with someone that he, with whom you never spoken before, you never worked before. You publish a paper with a co-author with whom you worked with. So co-authorships are a way to show, to prove scientific collaboration or technological co collaboration depending on the type of paper. But when you look at patent co-ownership, all these other organizations disappear. And this is why we can speak of knowledge predation. And it's not just Amazon. Here you have the same big companies that I showed you before. And the share of co-ownership, uh, of co, um, yeah, it's co-owned patents with respect to co-authorships is nothing. Basically, they co-author with hundreds of organizations, but they just patent with almost any organization at all. And when we see the organizations they are patenting with, they are mostly firms. So this is particularly affecting universities, but also, of course, affecting startups. With startups, there is also another story uh, where tech giants and big pharma companies use them also to outsource steps of the innovation process. And sometimes, when they want to, when they need to, they acquire the companies. But again, it's a way to outsource the risks. We can come back to that later on. But what I want to also emphasize is that it's not only affecting startups and universities and public research organizations, but these companies also have the capacity to profit with initiatives that were developed precisely to counterbalance their power, such as the open source software initiative. So they are also conquering, profiting from forms of knowledge commons. They do so in different ways, and in one of the papers you have to read, uh, you have as the reading material, I show with Lundbaal an example of how there, is, there was way more people working for projects that were put in open source by Microsoft, Google, and Facebook than people registered as working for these companies in the platform where the project was put in open source. And you may say, yeah, but still the project is put in open source. Yes, but software works like a puzzle. And you have different pieces of the puzzle. And if you know exactly how the whole puzzle looks like, you will know that there are some pieces that you can share with others, but that nobody will be able to put all the puzzle together if you don't share certain key pieces. So this is basically what happens in the relationship between secrecy and open source software uh, in the case of the digital economy. There are things that are put in open source, but that are uh, that are ultimately further contributing to reinforce the intellectual monopoly of these companies. I can also come, and come back to this later on, but just two things to conclude. One is the effects of all this process. As I mentioned, these companies base their power on predation and rentiership. Of course, they also accumulate capital, but predation and rentiership are zero-sum games. So the more they get, the less others will get. And this has effects at different levels. First, it is uh, delinking this process of innovation leads to economic growth. And there are uh, many ways to show that although we are in the midst of, of a so-called second phase of the ICT revolution, economic growth, in particular in Western countries, but overall for the world as well, is not at the level that we would be expecting given that we are supposedly in the middle of a <clears throat> technological revolution. But also there are a lot of uh, effects at the level of workers, at worker super exploitation, and this has two dimensions of analysis. One is where you work. Of course, work in principle, working for Amazon is better than working for a subcontractor. But it's not that every task you perform in Amazon will lead you to a better job. Even the uh, warehouse workers in Amazon earning more than the minimum salary in the US, they do earn more, it's true, per hour, but they are required to work with so many stress, so many stressful working conditions, even with, um, with uh, uh, a way of controlling their movements from their hands. So the way they work is so painful that even if they get an extra salary, is definitely not compensating for the requirements in terms of productivity that they are being put under. So it's not both things need to be taken into account, and I don't have time to develop this, but let me just develop two things about the peripheries also. Because all these companies, all the intellectual monopolies in general, most of them, let's say, not every, <coughs> come from poor countries. Therefore, on top of nature extractivism from the peripheries, there are two other forms of extractivism to consider. One is knowledge extractivism, science and technology that is produced 
in developing countries, in peripheral countries, but that is monetized, that is turning into an intangible asset in core countries. And the other one is data extractivism, so a more a, a raw, the rawest form of knowledge that is also produced in the whole world. However, it's been transformed into digital intelligence and contributing to the intellectual monopoly of just a handful of companies from core countries. Therefore, if we look here at the geographies of digital capitalism, we will see that it's not only value being concentrated in two countries, but also that there are flows of data and knowledge and nature that move from around the world to these countries. Because yes, digital economy is a lot about intangibles, but I also showed you that it's a lot about tangible investment. And in addition, it's also a further expansion of nature extractivism, in particular of lithium and cobalt, which are mostly based in or mostly found in peripheral countries. And the digital economy and the data-driven intellectual monopolies of the digital economy are not only these companies that we all know very well, but there are other companies that are becoming more and more data intensive and applying the same methodology to appropriate data, process that data, and uh, use the digital intelligence to inform its business. One example is BlackRock, and another example is Big Pharma. We can again come back to this. Just summing up, and then I have a small policy discussion. Uh, capitalism is led by data-driven intellectual monopolies, and they exercise both knowledge, including data and value appropriation. They organize these corporate innovation systems from which they collect uh, the knowledge and transform it into intangible assets that further reinforce its intellectual monopoly. And also intellectual monopolies contribute to reinforce underdevelopment. And they bring more complexity, and this is where I'm moving now, more complexity to analyze the interplay between corporate and political powers. Because these companies are also policy makers. They're not only part of the advisory boards of their respective countries when it comes to AI investments, and this is both in the US and China, but also, these companies are the rulers of their digital republics. They decide what can be done and, when, and what cannot be done in each of the platforms they control. And this leads to clashes of power with um, their respective governments and, of course, with governments around the world. As, uh, as it is explicitly stated by Mark Zuckerberg, they are constantly making decisions. They are constantly making political decisions. Therefore, they are constantly defining norms, rooms, re rules, and policies that affect our everyday life. And, but at the same time, these companies reinforce they start their, uh, the hegemony of their own states. And this is also why they are not being regulated as much as we all may think they should. Because even though they expand the polarization inside their countries, and keep appropriating more value from society at large and also within their countries, they further contribute to make the US the US and now China, China. So the world's largest powers. And just a picture on this, look at the top 100 companies that I was presenting you in the beginning, but now distributed in terms of countries. 59 of them come from the US, 14 from China. Policy debate. So what is to be done? What would you say, this will take a bit more because I want to ask you questions. What would you say that has been done so far? What were the policy uh, attempts, at least, to regulate these companies in the EU, in China, and in the US? Yes. In the EU, we still have like, like 2002 e-commerce um, directive laws that, that many countries try to like, basically national, uh, only attempts, like the German Nestle, And regulate them how? What means regulate for them? What type of policy? GDPR. GDPR is for data, yes. We will go back to GDPR in one second. But these companies in particular, besides data, yes. There's also a discussion about dismantling companies. Breaking them up? What other things? Yes. 
tax them according to where they make profits or where they get revenues. Yes. I'm sorry? Algorithm audits, audits, risk assessments. Exactly. And of course, there is a lot of discussion about antitrust. They are being considered as monopolies, or there is a discussion of whether these companies can be considered as monopolies. So let's start by there. Let's start to think about, OK, antitrust, could that be an option? They are trying to prove that these companies are monopolies. But it's quite complicated, because the focus, again, is the market. And it's very complicated to prove that Facebook or Amazon are monopolies. Because there's indeed a lot of other companies offering e-commerce and they're trying to develop national options as well. There's also a discussion about nationalization going on and some attempts to say, okay, should they be nationalized? Nationalizing these companies, although it seems quite unlikely, will still not solve the problem for most of the world because these companies are pretty much based in only two countries. So antitrust is mostly based on competition and it will, and we will see more and more cases. The European Union tried to go three times against Google. It kind of won, but still didn't get any money because Google keeps, keeps appealing. So the idea of going against these companies just by looking at the market structure seems quite ill-equipped. They're not really looking at what's inside those companies. An alternative, indeed, as you said, could be to break them up. But let's say that succeeds. Perhaps you don't remember, but Alibaba is already broken up. Because Jack May, at one point, decided that he wanted to get rid of uh, Yahoo and other uh, Western and Japanese investors, and therefore kept Alibaba as it was, but it's, that decided to do a spin-off of the, fin the fintech, which nowadays is Ant Group. And of course, Ant Group and Alibaba, although they are formally two different companies, legally two different companies, cross data. So it's not about how big the company is in terms of its legal structure, but it's also about how the company can just share its data. And in fact, intellectual monopolies do uh, agreements between them that allow them to, they do cross-licensing agreements. So they use each other's patents without paying. So nothing limits these companies in the future if, let's say, a lot of things happen and they are broken up to keep exchanging data, which is the core of these companies' power, and not only data, but also their capacity to <coughs> analyze that data. <coughs> so we come to what you were saying, your name? Peter. Peter. So Peter was saying GDPR. GDPR is the way the, the EU is trying to regulate access to data, and yes. The GDPR has pretty much not been enforced. Yes, exactly. It's a complete failure for many reasons. The most obvious one, these companies in Europe operate through Ireland. Ireland is not complying with GDPR. But let's say they make Ireland comply. First, GDPR and all the different policies put in place in relation to uh, give back to the owner of the data, its data, or the ownership of data, first, further contribute to creating tangible assets. Second, are ill-equipped because they do not realize that data is a relation. When I post something in my Instagram that is commented, shared by someone else, when I buy something on Amazon, it's not my data. It's my data with the data of the seller, with the data also of the reviews that I read to decide what I was going to buy. And of course, it also entails the platform that was in between. So who's going to own that data? What data will be mine and will be from someone else? And on top of that, tech companies are already anticipating an era where harvesting data will not be as free as it is now. And they are developing, I go to you in one second, they are developing new technologies to rely less on data, such as transfer learning and federated learning. These are federated learning basically allows them to collect, to more than collect, allows them to analyze data from our phones without the need to take it out of our phones. So this idea of you cannot take the data away, they will not take the data away. They will just learn from our data and the data will be left wherever it was. And transfer learning is a way uh, in which the deep learning algorithms can learn from a, from a different scenario based on the learnings they did from a similar scenario. And the easiest example is for languages, from translators. Because for some languages, let's say English and Spanish, there, is, there are a lot of examples to train the algorithm 
to make it a good translator. But if you need to translate from two languages that are spoken by just a reduced portion of the world's population, you will not have so many examples to train the algorithm so that the algorithm is afterwards ready to make the translations. So transfer learning basically builds a new model based on different parts of different algorithms that were trained for that already. Transfer this for Amazon. Amazon wants to start a new business in Argentina. It's not there. It doesn't have the data. But it has the data from Brazil and Mexico. It also has data from some countries like uh, European countries. And it may infer that in Buenos Aires, life is quite similar to some European countries. Therefore, it can create a model that, of course, it will not completely replace the lack of data, but it will make it less reliant on data. Yes? Yes, I, I can come back to that in one second. And also the difficulties, there, there are many difficulties in terms of where the data can be stored, how the data can be accessed, who can access that data. But it's not only about data. It's also, as I've been claiming this uh, whole uh, early afternoon, and this relates to this idea of, OK, let's make data social. Because the alternative could be, if we don't want to privatize data, let's socialize data. But if we socialize data, as much as I would love that, that would fade for, uh, further favor big tech companies. Because they have the best algorithms. So we will be giving them the data for free, even freer than they are already accessing. So it's not only a matter of the policies we put in place for data. It's not only a matter of how we manage data, but it's also an necessarily a matter of how we handle, we handle knowledge as a whole. And that includes, in this case, algorithms. And it also includes the digital infrastructure. Because nowadays, if you want to process a deep learning model, you need the processors that are in these companies' uh, data centers. So after this quite um, very uh, positive analysis, what is to be done? And to be honest, this is not a question that I am supposed to answer. None of you is supposed to answer. But this is a master on policy. So we need to reflect on this. But we need to think that it's not that we are not supposed to answer because we are not policymakers. No, it definitely those that are policymakers nowadays are way uh, far from finding solutions. I think that it's not that something that we should answer by ourselves. This is something that we should need to discuss in democratic environments with a lot of people being involved and being informed and with all the information to be prepared, to be at the knowledge frontier when it comes to understanding how this works. Because if not, we will not be prepared to regulate these companies and to think about alternative ways of producing and managing knowledge in society. So these are just some open thoughts of things that can be done. The first is science, technology, and innovation policies by themselves will not work. And of course, the states still need to invest in education, in R and public R&D, and so on and so forth. But if they just invest on that, they will be contributing to tech giants and, in general, intellectual monopolies profit. Because these companies will keep appropriating knowledge. If we do not discuss in an in a larger way what's been at stake, we will just end up reinforcing this company's power. And this is why we need to discuss a new common knowledge regime that, of course, it needs to rely in, on more public and free education. Again, it's not only about making knowledge public, but also about making the people ready to understand and produce new knowledge. Another thing is that peripheral countries must have their own agenda. They cannot wait until core countries change the state of, the, of what's going on nowadays. Because as I said before, hegemonic powers are reinforcing their own power on the basis of their intellectual monopolies. But going beyond science technolo and technology policy, and as uh, you, your name? Yours, with the glass, yes. Okay. As Natalia was saying, there is also a discussion about taxes. When we think of policies, we always, when we think of regulation, actually, we tend to think of policies. And we forget the other side, taxes. We can tax these companies. We must tax these companies and also these companies' shareholders and the asset managers that manage the shares of, this, of uh, a lot of shareholders. And on top of all that, and just really, really to conclude, really, 
I swear. The next slide is the thank you slide. Uh, I think that uh, what we need is to do what they are doing. We need to develop a plan. We need to become the planners of the future. And this plan needs to consider every dimension of society. It needs to consider what's going on in economics, but also in social, political, ecological realms. It needs to tackle every dimension of society. And yes, indeed, this can sound, can sound quite irrealistic, although the technological requirements to do so are already there because they are already using them. But as much as this sounds uh, quite unfeasible, these companies have already monopolized our knowledge in so many respects. Let's not allow them to also appropriate the capacity to create new and better worlds. So with that, I finish. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you, Dr. Recap. Um, my name is Theodore Claussen, uh, and my colleague Kamal Rambareth and I are going to serve as the discussion discussants. Um, Kamal is going to start by presenting a quick summary uh, and explore some of the issues related to policy and development. I'm then going to take up um, some of the kind of methodological issues and um, try to tease out some of the tensions uh, in the two essays that we read, um, and then Kamal is going to conclude. Thanks so much, Ted. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, so we're talking a lot about uh, things that you can't see and touch so much. Uh, we're talking about intangibles, and it reminded us of a quote uh, by Amilcar Cabral. Amilcar Cabral was a Cape Verdean and Guinea-Bissau revolutionary who uh, succeeded in independence in Port uh, from Portuguese rule in 1975. He was both a revolutionary and a thinker, and when you trace the intellectual currents throughout the, the, the liberation movement in Africa, you'll almost always find Cabral as, uh, as a tributary. He famously said that, if a bandit comes into my house and I have a gun, I cannot shoot the shadow of the bandit, I have to shoot the bandit. Many people lose energy and effort and make sacrifices combating shadows. We have to combat the material reality that produces the shadow. We're living through a tumultuous time. The effect of cloud computing, big data, and the internet of things, AI, all of these things have created incredible opportunity and rent-seeking opportunities through things like machine learning, human-machine interactions, and so on. The source of capital accumulation has gone from uh, an emphasis on tangible to an emphasis on intangible. Many jobs are disappearing and new ones are emerging in the, in the creative destruction that was described by Schumpeter. Exact and often invasive monitoring and surveillance of the workplace is becoming pervasive. All of these things coupled with a constant digital presence, a constant digital connection that's blurring this line between where you work and uh, where you don't work and these spheres of life. Mostly we're dealing with intangibles. We're dealing with knowledge goods. We're dealing with a phase of capitalism in which it's easier to see the shadows than it is to see the bandit. Allow me to briefly, just quickly go over some of the ideas of, uh, of Dr. Rika, but she did it so I won't be able to give it justice. So very quickly, um, there's this kind of continuous innovation from these uh, tech giants, and this gives them an ability to centralize and analyze customized data, and this is why we call them data-driven intellectual monopolies. Um, yeah, we, we, we only have that one slide. <laughs> yeah. I, I hope you're listening and not reading, because <laughs> otherwise you're not getting any of this. Um, so, <clears throat> um, kind of the methodology of the papers that we've read is looking at the science and technology collaborations, so co-authorship and the patents, so co uh, ownership of patents. And uh, Dr. Rickup shows uh, a kind of uh, a, a disconnect between these two things, which represents a predation, right? Uh, and I just want to go over this idea of predation very quickly because it's not used in the no normal sense of predatory pricing or predatory uh, 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 labor practices. This predation is kind of speaking about a, a predation of direct production relation. And it's it's about taking goods aggressively, right? 
And it, 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 the implication of this is how these tech giants plan and organize production and innovation networks, how they extract data from innovation, uh, from, uh, from innovation networks, individuals and, and organizations, and how they extract intellectual rents with anyone that they really deal with. Finally, and I think uh, quite importantly, uh, Dr. Rickup explains the way that these tech giants like Amazon appropriate value. Uh, she gives a nod to the Marxist theory of surplus value when she says that to some extent, the lower prices at Amazon's marketplace are paid for by workers, with the value being extracted through worsening wages and labor conditions. And I think that it's at this point, I this is the point at which the non-physical, the ethereal, uh, digital economy bears the scars from an underlying materialism. So th that's the crux of the ideas, right? Um, and uh, my critical engagement was really about uh, a long complaint about how there aren't policy implications in these papers, but there's, I'm very grateful that we've had a whole section on, on policy implications, so maybe I can deepen that discussion a little bit. Um, so, it's clear that what's happening in terms of international relations around these monopolies is detrimental to developing countries, right? Uh, uh, intellectual property is often a huge barrier to development and, and is a huge cost to developing countries, but there's also a direct extraction of rent uh, that's going from poor countries to rich countries through the system. Uh, but it's kind of less clear about exactly exactly how how we should go about changing this right uh, this work shines light onto the bandit but it doesn't speak exactly about the policies that we should use to shoot the bandit um, then on a, a quick discussion about china um, in the papers that we've read the 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 uh, it's kind of said that the only country that's been able to defy this this um, this intellectual monopolization of GAFAM has been China. And I think that it could be problematic for two reasons to look at China. Firstly, is because they're also reproducing monopoly capitalism, um, in, in a sense, uh, but also because China has been able to block their domestic markets and data, and they've been able to create their own intellectual monopolies through long-term planning, entrepreneurial state systems and big markets but most countries can't replicate having 1.2 billion people living in them right most countries can't replicate China uh, and further China has a political economy uh, that controls the reliance of, uh, of FDI and trade so they're a country that doesn't get whipped by the whip of sanctions and bilateral trade agreements that most other countries in the developing world do and so what's the lesson what do we do? Uh, what is to be done? Uh, is it to build regional blocks with large demand capacity, ignore intellectual uh, international IPR? Do we challenge the hegemony? Maybe, and maybe this is what is meant in the paper by Rickup when it says that a major coordination effort is meant. I think maybe being a little bit more explicit in our discussions today would be, would be quite helpful. Um, and I mean, the constraints remain. It's scary because uh, in the most recent experiment of COVID-19 patents, uh, we weren't even able to kind of deal with that. In, in the context of a life-saving drug during a pandemic, we weren't able to confront this Goliath of uh, intellectual monopolies. And, and it kind of, it becomes scary to think that how are we supposed to do it for other technologies? How are we supposed to do it for anything else? Um, and so, Within the parameters of the current system, it's, it's very daunting that we can think about changing the system. And so we need to really think hard about how we expand the parameters of the system and, and how do we do this. So just to provoke some, some thoughts and, and from uh, Dr. Rickup and from the rest of the class, you know, we should be thinking about can TRIPS protect developing countries' development from bilateral trade sanctions? Can we regulate the size of these monopolies? Can we restrict the use of data? Should we build international tax systems? Are we able to punish undemocratic political influence? And I'm really glad that all of these things that I've just said you mentioned in your in, in a few minutes ago. Um, so 
we need to really think about uh, 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 the nuts and bolts, the political compromises and the trade policy. We need to really think about the actionable steps. I need to take off my mask because um, it always makes my glasses fog up. Um, so um, my comments are going to go in a little bit of a different direction. Um, so as Kamal has synthesized and has, has been uh, already explained, the key thesis of Dr. Recap's work uh, is that intellectual monopoly is allowing these big tech companies, uh, the GAFM um, companies, to accumulate profits by the combination of rentiership and predation. Um, and so I want to focus here on some of the research methods um, deployed in the two papers that we read. I'm going to examine some issues related to methodology, and then I'm going to uh, situate um, this notion of intellectual monopoly capitalism in the broader history of uh, political economy. Um, and so I'm hoping to draw out some maybe tensions in, in the papers that we read, um, or at least attempt to. Um, and some of this will have to be shortened because much of it was anticipated, I think, in the lecture today. Um, so just as a word about the research methodology, um, I think, so we're doing this program in economics, uh, but the empirical research methods, I think, are a very creative way to um, study the modern corporation, uh, and in particular, intellectual monopolies. So of course, this is not just the analysis of financial statements, but includes the cluster analysis and the semantic uh, analysis. Um, we already heard earlier about that. Um, but going into maybe the main thing I'd like to say, um, uh, so, to situate this type of work in the history of economic thought, um, first of all, it contributes to this literature on intellectual monopoly capitalism, um, which has developed in the last decade. Um, Ugo Pagano termed the coin, or sorry, coined the term, um, and then uh, Cédric Durand and others have developed and extended the concept. Um, but I think it's also important to recognize that it also links into this other longer history um, of uh, political economic thought. Uh, on the one hand, there's this Marxian strain via Baron and Sweezy. They are the ones who theorized monopoly capitalism in the 1960s. Um, and then there's uh, Marx himself, who spoke of centralization and concentration of capital. Um, there's also then not Marxist, but uh, there's Schumpeter, who uh, theorized creative destruction, and Veblen, uh, who over 100 years ago was already writing about intangibles. Uh, so why is this important? Um, so I would argue that this is important because in the papers, um, Dr. Recap uh, deploys a lot of the concepts uh, from these different scholars. Um, and um, I, I would warn, though, that I think there is a possible danger of doing this uh, because it could lead to perhaps some issues of conceptual and methodological consistency. So what do I mean by that? Um, let's take Marx and Veblen. Marx, on the one hand, he develops concepts based on uh, the dialectical method uh, and through his analysis of the commodity, he derives a set of interconnected concepts of value. Um, Veblen, on the other hand, uses this empirical method uh, to, uh, to test his theory. Uh, and, you know, I'm not a philosopher, but it does raise the question of whether you can actually integrate concepts from different schools of thought uh, in a coherent way. Um, I think you can mix them, but you also have to be very careful about it. Um, so it's just um, kind of a word of warning, perhaps, for, for people like myself who also like to try to mix these things. Um, and I think this is important in this case because throughout these papers that we've read, there are these Marxian value categories that are used throughout the text. So accumulation by dispossession, shares of produced surplus value, redistribution of value at the system level. Um, going on, um, I think there's another reason to kind of situate this within this older literature in political economy. So um, let's take the example again of Braun and Sweezy. Um, they had their theory of monopoly capitalism. Uh, but they used it to formulate um, a theory of the macro macroeconomics of, uh, of the system in this context. So they theorized a new law of motion of capitalism, um, and they theorized that econ economic stagnation would result from this uh, monopoly. Um, but in this literature, since Pagano, uh, Durand, and Dr. Recap, um, my reading of this literature is that these authors sort of shy away a bit from actually talking about what the macroeconomic, macroeconomic dynamics are. So are there implications of this analysis for crisis theory, for example? Um, does intellectual monopoly lead to stagnation, like Braun and Sweezy would have argued back in the 1960s? Um, uh, the development of these issues, I think, would be uh, very interesting. Um, so here's a bit I'd have to shorten, because um, 
it was already covered. So I, I, um, I did have a bit about how the labor process was not really treated in the articles um, that we read, uh, but then in the lecture it was. So I think that's something I could, um, I could go over here. Um, so just to move on to my final point, um, I think, and it I think ties in with what Kamala was saying about what is to be done. Um, and so we have this theory of intellectual monopoly, uh, which the starting point is the theory of the firm. Uh, and it has this longer history with this, with heterodox political economy. Um, but I also wonder whether there's a possible danger of, um, of uh, in, in ways that perhaps this literature could be misread. Um, because I think the authors themselves are mostly Marxists. Um, but um, by focusing on intellectual monopoly, I could see that people could read this literature by saying that it, so the implicit, um, it implicitly reproduces capitalist ideology. Provocation here. Um, but if the issue is monopoly, does it not sort of imp imply that then the issue is just getting rid of the monopoly and capitalism would just be better uh, without these monopolies? Um, I think in today's age uh, where we're facing environmental catastrophe uh, and so many uh, issues related to equity, um, that maybe that's not even the question anymore. Um, and then maybe, um, maybe the target should be capitalism itself um, rather than just monopoly. Thanks, Ted. Um, okay, so just to conclude, um, now that you've seen our uh, a riveting PowerPoint presentations with all the animations, uh, let's return once more to, to Cabral, okay, before we finish. Cabral was a revolutionary who was clear that human liberation required resistance on four formations. The one was political, the other was armed resistance, the third was cultural resistance, and the fourth was economic resistance. In this new phase of intellectual monopoly capitalism, we need to be very, very clear about the bandits and how they operate. Dr. Rickup and others are doing important work on shining light in that direction, shining light on the bandit. And respectfully, within a democratic framework, future policy makers in this room really do need to take this seriously and be pointed about some of the ways that we can offer economic resistance to this phase of capitalism. We need to aim our policy, not at the shadows, but at the bandit itself. Thank you. Um, and then to just Moi compensate for the fact that uh, we didn't have animation, we've arrête. kind of summarized our ideas in this in these papers. So if you just take one and pass one on, that would be great. So there, honestly, thank you. Like, it was amazing. Really, really, really good things. Um, way better than, and to be honest, I'm not exaggerating, way better than most of the typical questions and things I get in conferences and, and places where academics that are supposed to be way more serious are. So, so this is amazing. And therefore, I will just choose to answer to some of these things. I will not talk about China. Um, I have papers on China and what I think about China. So you can read that. You can read also in my book, there is a chapter on China. And the same for the labor process. It's true that I left it away from those papers. Unfortunately, we are very trapped with this thing of papers and we end up writing 10,000 words and even if we try to put everything inside then it doesn't work for publication and that's why I write books also because I also like the freedom to explore in a more coherent and complete way what I think and in the book uh, which is free for you that's why I feel free to say this in the book in, chap in chapter 10, 10 I uh, develop a whole section on labor it's true that it's not the focus of, of the book, but it's also true that there is a lot of people that have been working, and I give you one name, uh, Benjamin, Benjamin Selwyn. He's an amazing author and colleague, and he's been working a lot on the effect both of global value chains and also now working on the effects of digital tech giants on labor. He has this concept of global poverty chains that is quite powerful uh, in my point of view. So I will not speak about that. <coughs> Also about what is to be done 
and, and indeed I use the what is to be done because, uh, because of course I have a lot of Marxist background and, but I will come back to that in one second. But what is to be done is a highly complicated question because I also think that ultimately what is to be done is to build a new way of reproducing our species that is not capitalism. But just by saying that, I'm not helping in any way. What I think that is to be done, or that can be done in the very short term, is to try to further analyze and understand capitalism as a whole. And to do that, we, of course, choose different starting points. And Marx chose the commodity, and from the commodity, he built up an understanding of the whole capitalism. In my case, I found that it was better to start from something that clearly everyone would understand as problematic to show that that problematic thing is rooted in capitalism. And that's why I showed you that capitalist competition, together with how knowledge is produced, engenders these companies. So as much as we want to eliminate the companies that are there now, others will come up. Capital's intrinsic differentiation, the different access to knowledge in capitalism and how that becomes an intangible asset. Even if we don't have an intellectual property rights regime, it will be kept secret. So in the end, what I'm trying to do is to lead people to find out by themselves that there is no other alternative but to change the system. Because if I just claim that, and I, I was, and David can say that, I, when I was younger, I was way more direct in this way of thinking. But I realized that, mo that I was losing most of the audience. And I don't want to speak just to the convinced people. I want to speak to larger audiences, and not because I want to be famous. It's because I really want to change things. I really want to make people think by themselves, hey, this is deeply wrong. And it's not just, we cannot rely on the US state or the US Congress to control these companies. Another thing that I didn't say about what is to be done is that the services, in the case of tech, the services that they are offering, in most cases, generate natural monopolies. So think of the uh, search engine algorithm. The algorithm gets better as more data, therefore more searches it is processing. And it will be really painful for us. Try to pre prepare a paper and instead of looking for all the literature review on Google Scholar, search for it in 11 different places you will lose more time. So does that mean that we need to leave everything as it is? No, that shows us that indeed we need to centralize, but that centralization needs to be governed differently, it needs to be planned and organized differently. And a private way of producing digital services will always end up being detrimental for society. As much as we need these services to be centralized because they tend to natural monopolies. There's another thing I want to comment on, because the question was super, super, super important, really, and thank you. Thank you very much for bringing this point of the different backgrounds, because it allows me, I don't know if this will work if I just do like this, yes, to go to this. And this is not related to my talk today, but it's something that I think we should all be discussing. And it's about what's economics and how we do economics. And I don't know if you felt it. But to me, economics is like a zoo. We have different species. So we have the Poskensians, the Schumpeterians, the Marxists, the Seraphians, and of course the neoclassicals. Those can be the lions or I don't know. Yeah, because there are the kings and also at the same time, nobody likes them. So <laughs> could be. So we are in this zoo and we shout at each other. And sometimes the less powerful animals come together for some things that are really cool, like the epoch. But we don't really engage with each other's topics, discussions, ways of framing the arguments. We just rather step aside and just leave each other with our own cage. And that's highly detrimental because we're all trying to understand the same thing. As much as it is detrimental to think that economics by itself can analyze capitalism, we really need an interdisciplinary approach to these problems. Therefore, we need one, two, learn other disciplines, and two, to work with colleagues from other disciplines. And for me, it was a very hard, again, David can testify that, it was a very hard learning process to realize that I needed to use each other's ways of thinking and show that we are trying to analyze the same thing. So cumulative causation, absorptive capacity, 
These are concepts that, of course, do not come from the Marxist background. This comes mostly from the innovation studies literature. Even absorptive capacity comes from a paper that puts individuals see closer to organizations, and I have deep concerns on that way of thinking. Organizations are not the same thing as individuals. But anyway, the concept is useful, and it's useful to elaborate an argument. So I really don't think that it's problematic to build a stronger argument, more complete and coherent, by instead of just saying, this is my cage and I'm a Marxist, to try to establish dialogues with other people. And of course, it's my individual experience. We cannot uh, make a general assumption out of this, but it's been quite gratifying. Gratifying for my own research and also it has enabled me to speak to broader audiences. Audiences that would have otherwise not hear accumulation by dispossession, that rents are not just more profits or high profits, but an appropriation of value and all other things. And by doing so, I was last week, no, this week actually, I was this Monday giving a seminar and the question that I was given twice during the same talk was, can you explain a little bit more about rents? Why do you say that rents are an appropriation of value? So that type of questions, having the chance to speak to people about these deeper things, to me, are super important. So I seriously engage with all the literature I work with. I don't think we, need to, we have to criticize, like in, in Argentina, we would say desde la tribuna. So it's like being in a like part of the audience and just shouting, hey, bullshit. That does not help. That just creates enemies and blocks possibilities of talking with people that is also concerned with the same things we are concerned but somehow is tempted to try to find very short-term answers. And we need to solve them now. Of course, it's urgent, but there are no magic bullets. And that's part of what I want to say and try to work on in my research. There are no magic bullets, and there is no simple solution, and the new institutions that need to be built will take a lot of time if we manage to do them. We cannot, and that's why I'm also more and more speaking about this idea of plan and planning planning something that would have sound like completely out of the question in economics some time ago, and showing planning is already happening, the discussion about planning as unfeasible, the discussion as an alternative way of organizing production as unfeasible, doesn't hold anymore, because these companies are already planning. So these type of arguments are the type of powerful arguments that we need to keep building to answer to those that are concerned with the same things, but in the attempt to find a solution, they just try to find it in a sort of mid-term grounds, like, okay, intellectual property is not working that much, let's limit the number of years that someone has a patent. So that type of solutions are the ones that we need to challenge. And then one small thing that I wanted to say, but I don't know if I lost it, and perhaps I can shut up because I spoke a lot again. Ah, the macroeconomics analysis. Yes, it's true. Indeed, my, my first book and my second book, they do not deal with macroeconomic analysis for two reasons. The first one is uh, that is something that I still need to do, uh, not that I don't think it's interesting. The other one is that I think that most economists, most heterodox economists engage with macroeconomics and forget that capitalism is a global system. So macro is a bit micro, honestly. Even Leon Balra, the neoclassical economist, when he was thinking of the market as a network of markets and in a very abstract way, he was conceiving capitalism in a more global way than some macroeconomists. And I'm not, it's not that I forgot that there are, the economies are open, but the object of our study is capitalism, not a country. The country needs to be explained and its specificities within the global analysis. So that's why what I'm at the moment attempting to do is to elaborate on that larger picture. An attempt to building on that, also work on macroeconomic analysis, is one of the papers that you cited, the one with Cédric Durand, Tristan Aubray, and Joel Rabinovich. And there we analyze the five uh, core Western, well, Western slash Japan countries, so historically the top five countries in the world, and we do so both from a macroeconomics perspective and also at the firm level to try to show the changing dynamics of the last 40 years, splitting them in two and showing what happens since the 2000s onwards. If you want me to say one word, indeed I think that this leads to a form of stagnation. 
a form of stagnation in the sense, like intellectual monopoly capitalism, in the sense that there is a lot of knowledge that is being developed, but that is not contributing to growth. But at the same time, there is a question that needs to be raised concerning growth and where we need to grow and how we need to grow. So it's not just a matter of automatically say, stagnation, yes or no. Because again, it depends on where, what type of growth we want and so on. And I will shut up here, but yes, indeed, it's something that I've not, I've been not working much uh, with. Yes, yes.